Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, ABM talks and it's a pleasure uh, to have two ladies with us today, uh, which is great. Actually, the first time, if I recall it correctly, and it's uh, uh, an even greater pleasure uh, to have two very special uh, uh, ladies uh, with uh, an interesting background and an interesting uh, topic. Thank you very much, first of all, to... Um, uh, Professor Kama Ben Johnson for um, for um, uh, taking the time and uh, for enlightening us uh, about uh, a very interesting and provocative subject. Perhaps let's wait and see what you're going to tell to us. And it's nice to have Alexandra Kamra back, who has already been commenting. Uh, uh, on one of our talks, so it's um, a great pleasure, and without further ado, uh, I pass on to Riot, who will introduce the two speakers, and I have the privilege to relax and listen, and perhaps <laughs> uh, think about some comments and questions already. Thank you. All right, so hi everybody. Um... Thank you for this uh, short introduction. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Raoult Paz, and uh, together with uh, Tilo Maran, we lead a, a Dave Gay project dedicated to three things, seeing anti-Semitism and the law. Um, and as I always say, this is an open and safer context for all of us, all of us people who are interested in either of these topics to join on the last Thursday of every month at 11.30 thus far, but come September, so next month we're taking a holiday for, for a month. Uh, in September, we come back at 4 p.m. Um, as I said, not because I do not understand the difficulties of the time, uh, given some of us are uh, parents of young children who need to be picked up at that time, but after some complaints uh, from different parts of the world, uh, about the time uh, that people had to wake up super early or kind of stay up super late, uh, we decided uh, to, you know, to dedicate one day a month uh, at this time for talking about seeing anti-Semitism through law. Uh, I have a couple of uh, mentions before I introduce our amazing uh, women today. Uh, just a reminder. So first of all, we are hiring a postdoc and I will send you a personal email to all of the people who are on my list uh, what the job is all about and what we're looking for. So if you guys hear of anybody who's interested or um, uh, have something in mind and so on and so forth, we're really looking for amazing candidates. So please pass the word on. Second thing I wanted to mention again is that this, is, this project will lead us into an edited volume uh, that will be published at the end uh, of the three-year project. So whoever is interested, I mean, we'll nag all our commentators and we'll nag all our presenters anyway, but whoever is interested in, in contributing a chapter to our edited volume, regardless of giving a talk, please come to us too. And the last thing I wanna mention, I think I mentioned that already, that we'll, uh, we'll reconvene with uh, Dr. Meron Mendel on, uh, on the 30th of September at 4 p.m. So without further ado, I'll now move to introducing our um, uh, great two scholars who have actually translated the word Eshetish Kolot because I think both our women are, uh, um, you know, kind of fall under that title. And that means Renaissance women, so modern Renaissance women that you guys are. So thanks so much for um, taking the time and joining us. So we have um, uh, Karma uh, Ben Yohanan uh, joining us, and uh, Karma, help, she now just with the beginning of the pandemic, moved to Berlin um, to uh, take a chair in Jewish-Christian relations at the uh, Faculty of Theology at the Humboldt University. Uh, she studied history at the Tel Aviv University and held research and teaching position at the University of California, Berkeley, the Gregorian University in Rome, and at the Von Leer um, Center or Institute in Jerusalem. Uh, her research focuses on institutionalized religions in the uh, late 20th and early uh, uh, 21st century. And as we'll hear today, 
uh, Jewish Christian polemic and dialogue, secularization and political the theology. Um, Kalma's book is now being translated by the Harvard uh, University Press and is entitled uh, Reconciliation and its Discontents, Contemporary Mutual Perceptions of Christian Christians and Jews. Um, and as I said, yeah, it's being translated by uh, the Harvard University Press. Um, what I find amazing about this, uh, this book, and I hope that you'll talk a little bit about it, um, is just how she focuses, so Karma is focusing on the inter uh, debate that often we do not hear about. So how the Jews themselves consider the Christians internally and the other way around. So how uh, um, Roman Catholics, I should say, not Christians, but Roman Catholics more specifically, consider the Jews among themselves. Um, Alexandra Kemmer, who, as Tilo mentioned, uh, was already a commentator uh, for us and kind of was forced to join us today because there's just nobody else that is more perfect for the role. So thanks, Alexandra, for joining us again. So Alexandra is a senior researcher, fellow and academic coordinator of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. Uh, uh, Alexandra is also the head of the Heidelberg uh, uh, um, Max Planck Institute here at, in Berlin. And she is now in the process of finishing her book entitled Law, Exile and the Making of a Transnational a Constitution, A Life of Eric Stein, that explores how Stein's life illustrates more than 60 years of transnational laws and politics. And actually, in that case, you guys have something in common that you both have kind of in your research focus. Uh, 60 uh, very detrimental years, uh, however different. So yeah, so as we met, uh, so just randomly in a, in a friendlier context, well, not that this is not friendly, but you know what I mean, just the three of us, and we started debating and discussing religious issues, uh, it was clear that this day will come. And I'm so happy that this day came today, even though uh, some of us some, some people have contacted me about, like, why is it in July and why isn't it in a different time and, and, and point, and, and I'm so happy that it's being recorded so whoever has an interest can watch it later. So uh, without uh, saying anything else right now, I pass the floor to um, Professor Karma ben uh, if you have a, If you have slides, you are welcome to, uh, I hope, uh, Aisha, maybe you can uh, co- uh, I think Professor Ron well, has to make her the call. Oh, Sandra, uh, yeah, co co host. Yeah, okay. Are you now a co, co host? Then you can upload your. Yeah, I will um, upload it in a second, but maybe I can, uh, I can just start by thanking you um, very much for the invitation, Reut and Professor Mongao. How do you pronounce your name? Marau? That's the way it is? Okay. As an Israeli, it's always very hard uh, with the pronunciations, even after one year in Berlin. So I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm honored for the invitation. And this really seems like a fascinating series. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this. Um, and it's lovely to meet you all. Uh, I see also some familiar faces. So Dina, it's so good to see you. Good that you're here. And uh, Alexandra, I'm really looking forward to your uh, comments as well. And hopefully this is only a first time that we all uh, meet and not the last, maybe someday in person too, who knows? So, okay, when Reut invited me, uh, I thought first of all on how I can engage with a wonderful painting of Synagoga, The Pretty Jewess by uh, Shaya Badi, uh, that decorates the invitations to uh, the Abraham Bar Menachem talks. So now I will share screen so this could a host disabled participant screen sharing this is what i get i can continue until a solution is found no i think i think you can try now i just saw the that you're you've just been made a co-host so i think you should try now again to okay. just share your screen so let's see if it works. Great, it yeah. works? Do you yeah. see everything? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, great. 
Okay, so here we are with a, a Shia Abadi's painting. And um, since I am a scholar of Jewish Christian relations, it wasn't so hard to find a, a connection uh, with this uh, wonderful uh, depiction. Um, and so at the heart of this talk, uh, um, I would like to, uh, to speak about a specific recent Jewish depiction of Synagoga, uh, this time not a painting, and of course of her sister Ecclesia, who is interestingly absent from uh, Shia Badi's painting, but she will be here with us today. Uh, but before that, uh, I will say a few words uh, of introduction. So uh, the pretty eye-covered Jewess and her triumphant counterpart had, as you all know, a long and painful history in the realm of Jewish-Christian relations as a symbol that captures the foundational ambivalence of Christianity towards the Jews. The veil on synagogue's eyes, and this of course echoes uh, Paul's second uh, epistle to the Corinthians, testifies to Ecclesia's triumph and in particular her triumph in reading the Old Testament properly, unlike synagogue's obsolete adherence to the literal carnal meaning of the Torah. This is the way, that more or less the traditional way uh, um, the uh, Christian uh, tradition has uh, um, looked at uh, Judaism, uh, more or less since the uh, second uh, century. So these essential components of what we now call supersessionism, and I'm sure you're uh, well aware of the, uh, of the concept, it were a subject for constant deliberations in the last six decades or so, as Christian theologians and intellectuals all throughout the Western world have turned to revisit the Christian tradition's perception of Jews and Judaism, struggling with a difficult question about the connection between modern antisemitism and traditional Christian anti-Judaism, what the French Jewish historian Jules Isaac has named the teaching of contempt. The collapse of the Christian teaching of contempt has various and complex reasons, and we can also return to that if you'd like in the Q&A section. But theologically speaking, uh, it was due to the refutation of two fundamental assumptions, which were at the basis of the Christian tradition's approach to Jews and Judaism. The first, in the, uh, um, in the words of the historian Israel Yuval, was that the physical existence of the Jews within Christian society had to be guaranteed. The second, that the exile of the Jewish nation and the, and the destruction of its religious and political center at the land of Israel were punishment for the crucifixion. These two basic assumptions, continues Yuval, collapsed within a single decade. The first assumption vis-a-vis -vis Jewish survival was refuted when the dimensions of the final solution became known to the Christian world in 1945. The other assumption about eternal exile and destruction became obsolete with the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. This state of affairs has led in the following decades and especially from the 1965 declaration of the Second Vatican Council, Nostra Aetate, and its paragraph on Jews and Judaism to an ongoing process of theological pondering and to the revision of the Christian perceptions uh, of Jews. The age old polemic between Christianity and Judaism seems to have become finally a matter of the past and synagogue's veil was thrown along with this polemic into the trash can of history. Yet this picture of Jewish Christian relations in recent decades takes into account only Christian subjectivity. It is, so to say, Ecclesia that reconstructs its image of synagogue, that takes the veil off her sister's eyes and no longer seeks to replace her. How, however, does the pretty Jewess perceive her relationship with its former oppressor, now that it is allowed to look into her eyes directly? Does synagogue agree that indeed a post polemical age has begun? Interestingly, both the theological and the historical literature on contemporary Jewish Christian rapprochement is dedicated almost solely to the Christian change of heart, while Jewish perceptions of Christianity and of Jewish Christian relations remain marginal. This scholarly tendency, mutatis mutandis, recapitulates the old asymmetry, which was so characteristic of Christian Jewish relations throughout the ages whereas Judaism was an object in the orbit of Christian subjectivity, 
part of an intra-Christian identity formation, so to say, and not really a side in the conversation. It is, however, important to remember that the polemic with Christianity was enormously significant to the involvement of the Jewish tradition, of Jewish biblical exegesis, of Jewish theology, and of Jewish perceptions of history. It is in this sense only natural that the transition Christian attitudes to Jews and Judaism in the last few decades will join the historic events of the Holocaust and the establishment of the state of Israel in evoking new Jewish evaluations of Christianity as well. One such evaluation, and not at all a trivial one, will stand at the focus of my talk today. In the time that I have left, I would like to discuss an unusual Jewish thinker, a thinker who accompanied the process of Jewish Christian reconciliation from a unique vantage point, <coughs> intersecting at least two intellectual worlds, which are usually considered as having nothing in common. Yehuda Leon Ashkenazi, who is known by his nickname Manitou, was born in 1922 in Algeria to an important dynasty of Sephardi rabbis. After serving in the French Foreign Legion in World War II, Ashkenazi moved to France and became a central figure in the Paris School for Jewish Thought, a Jewish intellectual movement which sought to restore French Jewry after the war. The Jewish movement included thinkers such as Yaakov Goldin, André Ner, and of course the most famous of them uh, is uh, Emmanuel Levinas. They wrote in French and combined Jewish erudition, Bible, Talmud, and Kabbalah with general philosophy, attracting literate Jews on the one hand and contesting the West for its moral failure in the Holocaust on the other. In the 50s, Ashkenazi went through a dramatic intellectual transition after becoming acquainted with Rabbi Tzvi Yudha Kuk, Avraham Yitzhak Kohen Kuk's son, who later became the undisputed leader of Gush Emunim, the right-wing Orthodox movement, committed to establish Jewish settlements in the occupied uh, territories in order to inhabit the entire geographical territory of the biblical land of Israel. Influenced by the Kuk school, Ashkenazi immigrated to Israel after the Six Day War and inspired many of his disciples to follow him. He continued influencing the French Jewish community in Israel and raised many disciples, including the prominent Zionist rabbis, Yom Aviner, Avraham Yoshua Zuckerman, Eliyahu and Shelton. Ashkenazi knew Christianity better than other thinkers in the circle of Tzvi Udakuk, and probably better than most Orthodox rabbis of his time. He was aware of the vast intellectual processes taking place within the Christian world after World War II and of the aggiornamento, the update in Catholic theology. Ashkenazi directly witnessed the changes in the attitude of Christian theologians and religious figures towards Judaism following the Holocaust and regarded them as a true revolution. The Holocaust, so he argued, had profoundly shaken the Christian consciousness. The Christian conscience, excuse me. After witnessing the Nazis fulfilling, this is how he sees that he sees the, uh, the issue, after the Nazis fulfilled what the church had preached throughout many generations, but did not dare to pursue, Christians made a moral and spiritual decision that such an atrocity should never repeat itself. He saw the undertaking of the struggle against anti-Semitism by church officials as one emerging from honest regret and from a sincere wish to repair the Christian doctrine. However, Ashkenazi believed that the church did not go far enough. Indeed, the Holocaust had motivated Christians to come closer to Jews and open a dialogue with them, but they did not dare to cope with the magnitude of the problem that history poses to them. Although the problem began with the Holocaust, the murder of Israel on Christian land, in the words of Manitou, its core is the establishment of the state of Israel, the resurrection of Israel on Jewish land. The restoration of Jewish sovereignty in the Holy Land, according to Ashkenazi, added further to the moral challenge which Christianity had to face, the challenge of Christian identity. Christian consciousness is called on for two complementary questions, he writes. On the one hand, it is discovering through the Holocaust the, the Jewish people as the suffering Messiah. 
On the other hand, the revival of the state of Israel shows them that Jewish identity is becoming Hebrew once more. And the history of the people of Israel is becoming an actual history after 2000 years. All this leads to an embarrassing discovery. Perhaps the Jews are Israel. And one can further ask, if the Jews are Israel, who then are the Christians? The establishment of the state of Israel was, according to Ashkenazi, an identity crisis for the church, even if the Christian world has not yet realized that. The identification between contemporary Jews and biblical Israel had pulled the carpet out from under the church's self-definition as the Veros Israel, as proclaimed by the prophets. Events that took place after the establishment of the state, and especially after the Six-Day War, further exacerbated this alleged crisis. The visit of Paul VI in Israel in 1964, the fourth section in the Second Vatican Council's Nostra Aetate on Jews and Judaism in 1965, the visit of John Paul II in the Great Synagogue of Rome in 1986, the di diplomatic um, agreement between Israel and the Vatican in 1993. In Ashkenazi's eyes, all these had a scatological significance, testifying that the church is indeed beginning to acknowledge that the Jews are the true inheritors of biblical Israel. Ashkenazi viewed the, the vulnerability of the church regarding its own identity as poetic justice. Throughout the continuous struggle of Esav and Jacob, Christianity had implanted profound self-doubts in the hearts of the Jews with regards to their own selfhood, existential doubts that characterized Ashkenazi Jewry throughout its diasporic history. The harm that Esau had caused Jacob symbolizes the self-doubts which Judaism had absorbed from Christianity to the point of forgetting its own identity. <clears throat> as paradoxical as it may seem, the phenomenon of the Anusim, the forced converts that are usually identified with the history of Spanish Jews, is more characteristic of, Ash of the Ashkenazi world, since it is about the Jewish soul being thrown into the world of Christian, <clears throat> both religious and secular resistance. In a sense, all diasporic Jews are unseen, sentenced to a humanistic world according to Greek-Roman measures. The life of the Ashkenazi Jew is more tragic in the Greek sense of the word. He went through exile while experiencing a grave doubt regarding his own identity, a doubt bearing horrific implications. To Ashkenazi, following the restoration of Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel, the Jews cease to be figures in a Jewish fiction, that is, religious symbols without actual solidity, and return to the stage of history. The fulfillment of biblical prophecies about the return to Zion testifies <clears throat> to the truthfulness of the literal Jewish reading of the Bible, a reading according to the flesh. Thus the Christian reading of the Bible according to the spirit is wrong. In a letter to Christian friends, Ashkenazi argued that the six day war was interpreted by Catholics and Protestants as a messianic event, even if they still hesitated to admit it. <clears throat> With the collapse of the Christian thesis about the prefigurative meaning of the Old Testament, Christianity's entire messianic thesis collapses as well. They have to drink something. <coughs> I'm recovering from a uh, flu or something. So, okay. <clears throat> Let's take it slow. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> so, instead of the Jews testifying to the truthfulness of the gospel, as argued by Augustine, the Christians have now themselves become witnesses, <clears throat> stupefied by the resurrection of the people of Israel, whose very survival was a total mystery to them for millennia. <clears throat> and here when he speaks about mystery, he's also in correspondence with a very famous Catholic philosopher, uh, Jacques Maritain, who speaks about the mystery of Israel. 
Thus, Ashkenazi turns the classic Christian perception of Judaism on its head. Christianity exists only to admit its error while facing Jewish redemption. Moreover, the traditional accusation of the Jews as refusing to acknowledge the Messiah falls, according to Ashkenazi, on the shoulders of Christians. The Christians were the ones who refused to acknowledge the Jewish messianic doctrine and rejected the route to salvation that the Jews have offered to all human beings. They have never succeeded in explaining to us how and why the church had founded its faith, its doctrine, its liturgy, and its institutions by rejecting Jewish messianism and its history. Well, this messianism applies to all of humanity and not solely to Jews. <clears throat> Gathering Ashkenazi's scattered comments reveals that he had made a systematic application of the Christian teaching of contempt, to borrow Julie Zak's term, to the Christians themselves. Christians were the ones to reject the good news. <clears throat> they were the ones who misunderstood scripture. They are the witnesses of the faith. And now, <clears throat> upon losing their identity, they are the ones required to justify their existence. Ashkenazi reads Christian anti-Jewish doctrine as a prefiguration to an opposite Jewish perception of Christianity, a perception which became possible only at his time when the messianic future seemed to be at hand and the hopes of Judaism realized. This role reversal would reach its peak in the conversion of Christians. The Christians slowly discover that it is not the Jew that has to be Christianized, but the Christian that has to be Judaized. And as much as this sounds provocative, think about how close this is with what we see now in biblical studies when Christianity really uh, reconnects to its Jewish biblical roots in a sense that really roots it back within Jewish soil. And of course, Ashkenazi is well aware of these processes. Through reversing the traditional Christian doctrine and Judaizing it against Christianity, <coughs> not only did Ashkenazi attempt to use Christianity's own weapons against it, he also sought to return the Christian doctrine to its Jewish sources in the spirit of the Catholic principle of ressourcement, the French-German theological movement that deeply influenced Vatican II. And Ashkenazi was in constant contact with one of its leaders, Jean Cardinal Daniele. The Christian doctrine is not a collection of nonsense, <coughs> Ashkenazi declared, in the ears of his Jewish and Christian audience, but a mythological piece which hides a great truth, the truth of Israel, its history and its faith. In this, so it seems, Ashkenazi echoed the Christian idea of the Talmud since the 13th century as containing important proof of the truthfulness of Christianity. So now the New Testament contains such proofs for the truthfulness of Judaism, of course. In order to truly understand Christianity, he maintained, one must return to the Hebrew sources of the Christian myth. <clears throat> Behind the Christian myth hides the identity of Israel, which was injected into a fictional figure and literally became an idol and a myth. Thus the Christian myth is not empty of meaning. On the contrary, it is full of meanings. It embodies the identity of Israel posed as a mediator between the creator and man. And for this, it is venerated. Through the idea that Christianity is a mythization of the Torah, Ashkenazi manages to create a theological bridge between the cook's fiercely anti-Christian theology and the prevailing discussion in contemporary Christian theological discourse of the need to discern between authentic historical components of, Christians, of the Christian story and its mythical components, presenting a Bultmann style perception of myth. The emerging of Christianity maintained Ashkenazi, expressed the penetration of Greek mythical mentality into Jewish identity. <clears throat> the first Christians, who were themselves Jews, had written the gospels as parables about the people of Israel. But the meaning of the myths was comprehensible in their, in their time. They, they knew what their meaning, what, they, what their intentions are. They were not the ones who sought to idolize the meat, according to Ashkenazi. But when the gospel made its way to the pagan world, 
A pagan dimension was added to the myth. The Gentiles confused between the parable and its meaning. Instead of understanding that Jesus represents the people of Israel and that his passion and resurrection symbolize the covenant of Israel and its redemption, they understood the people of Israel as a symbol for Jesus and the old covenant as representing the new. So everything is exactly uh, upside down. The time has come, says Ashkenazi, to teach the Christians what their myth really signifies. This can only be done by Jews. The gospels describing the object of Christian faith have a meaning that needs to be comprehended. This meaning, however, could be deciphered only by the Hebrews and only if the mythic garb is removed from it. The Christians have argued on many occasions that a veil separates the Jews from the Torah and that Christians need to explain the Torah to Jews. It is high time to reverse this method. <clears throat> if we want to begin understanding each other, it is necessary, first of all, that Jews explain the gospel to Christians. Jews must explain to Christians in the most brotherly way possible what Christians actually believe. The Jews must clarify that the dignity of the Christian faith can remain intact on the condition that their religion be purified of its mythical components. In this field, the Jewish-Christian dialogue had not yet begun. And here, as you notice, we return to our pretty Jewess, to our synagogue. Paul's veil, which absorbed the poisonous essence of, Jewish, of the Jewish-Christian history for centuries, was applied by Ashkenazi to the Christians. They, and not the Jews, are those blindfolded and with hardened hearts to the point that they can no longer understand the meaning of their own scripture. Paraphrasing Pope John Paul II's famous words that the Jews are the Christians' elder brothers, yes, that's the Fratelli Maggiore is now, is now probably the name uh, that is uh, used in the Catholic uh, world to describe Jews. Ashkenazi maintains it should be said without even a shred of irony or humor that as the Christians' elder brothers, the Jews are obliged to help the Christians in solving their problems of identity. And just to spell things out for those of you who are not well acquainted with uh, theology and with the Jacob and Esau story. So the issue is of course that historically there was always a controversy over the question, who is the younger brother? The Jews saw themselves as the younger brother and the Christians as well. So in a sense, in John Paul II's the sec the um, um, affirmation of the Jews as the older brothers, there is indeed some kind of a layer, a polemical layer uh, as well in Ashkenazi, uh, pulls this layer uh, and brings it out to the surface. Okay, so I think you got uh, uh, more or less uh, the point. And now I would like to uh, close with a few uh, concluding remarks. So I think I can also close my uh, PowerPoint now. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say, to be honest, I'm never quite certain to what extent this sharp critique that Ashkenazi stresses uh, against Christianity is intended to pose some kind of a mirror to Christian theology and to force Christian intellectuals to look deeper into their anti-Jewish heritage. And to what extent his supersession is rhetoric indeed reflects his perception of historical reality. This is a question. On the one hand, he often spoke of the need to help Christians and to cooperate with them in order to produce a positive theology of Judaism, to substitute the teaching of contempt, and strongly believe that the hostility between Christians and Jews was finally coming to an end. Nevertheless, reading between the lines, uh, there is also a fierce anti-Christian position here. Precisely when the Christian word, world was uh, uh, repentant about what it had done to the Jews by means of its theology, Ashkenazi adopted the, the Catholic teaching of contempt in its full, in all its parts. So I think just a few uh, insights to, uh, to conclude. Uh, maybe some of you know that Susanna Herschel, <clears throat> in a few uh, different uh, works, um, mentions that uh, or depicts the Christian attitude, traditional attitude towards Judaism as a colonization, a process of colonization. In this sense, if we have a process of colonization, then we can also see Jewish Christian rapprochement as a process of decolonization. And as you know, when we have processes of decolonization, we also see 
the ambivalence and the complexities of the subjectivity of the colonized. And it is quite clear that right this, this um, consciousness, which is always divided, always somehow adopting uh, also the colonizers' uh, subjectivity, this is quite clearly uh, present here uh, with Manitou. <laughs> Another factor which is important is that we see here that there is Jewish ambivalence towards Jewish-Christian relations and Christianity. I don't mean that Ashkenazi is necessarily a representative of the Jewish perception of Christianity, not at all. But this ambivalence exists. It exists not only in this one uh, figure, and this is something that maybe um, is worth uh, our uh, attention. <clears throat> And another uh, factor, which is, I, I find very interesting, is that of course the present moment in Jewish Christian relations invites not only Christian reflections on tradition, but also Jewish ones. And these would not necessarily behave in the same way as the Christians, the, as the Christian deliberations do. So our assumption that once Christianity uh, decided to uh, revise its tradition, this means that the Jews will necessarily jump on the wagon of reconciliation um, should also be uh, uh, somewhat uh, revisited. So notwithstanding the undeniable achievements of Jewish Christian reconciliation in the last decades, the relationship between synagogue and ecclesia is not without complexities also today, which complexities which are for us scholars to unveil. Thanks, and sorry for coughing all along. It's okay. We, we really don't mind. Uh, we're all in our own spaces anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so, so thank you for, for this. Um, I will uh, uh, give uh, Alexander the, the chance to comment. I was just thinking because it's the first time that I heard anything of, of, of the Ashkenazi that you were quoting. If an Ashkenazi could have said what Ashkenazi was saying, that's just a, a thought that I had. Um, but Alexandra, please, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kama, for this really great and thought-provoking presentation. And thank you also to Tilo Maraun and Riut Pass for having me again. It feels a little bit like Groundhog Day today, uh, but I promise I won't return <laughs> for the next couple of months at least. That's horrible, uh, don't say that. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm quite honored to be here um, to comment on this paper. And uh, I have to say, I was a bit hesitant when Reut invited me uh, to participate because I'm not trained as a theologian. I've studied some theology. I'm very much interested in it, but I'm speaking here as a lawyer and that's where I'm situated also. I'm in, I have a certain interest in <coughs> um, topics. So uh, I would like to, to think with you about the question, what this has to do with law. I mean, after all, this is a talk given in the context of a program which is titled and seeing antisemitism through law. Um, and also the, the series of talks is, uh, has some kind of legal context in, in, in a way. So I would like to stress this kind of legal situatedness um, of the topic and also the, uh, the impact it has on lawyers and legal scholarship and the relevance it has for us uh, discussing this in the context of a law faculty. Um, and uh, then I would like to uh, to talk with you a little bit about the context of the um, uh, of um, Ashkenazi's argumentation in uh, as a reaction of um, a Christian or Catholic reengagement with Judaism after the Holocaust and the events of the Second Vatican Council. Um, and of course, then I would like to engage with the argument Ashkenazi made. Um, uh, at the core about the uh, kind of turning from uh, turning on uh, on its head the the kind of Christian colonization as you put it now in the words of Susanna Heschel um, and turning it into a kind of uh, decolonial process. First of all, what's the legal relevance of um, of this and why engaging with it uh, as a lawyer? Um, the uh, the process of Catholic uh, engagement with Judaism after the Holocaust, and in particular in the context of the Second Vatican Council, which started in October 1962 and ended in December 1965, 
um, was the context of really a global event. The Second Vatican Council was not just some kind of intra-religious thing that happened in Catholicism, but for us today, um, it's hard to uh, hard to realize what a kind of global event it was. The oldest institution uh, in the world and really a very kind of st strictly structured and in a sense very legalistic uh, institution reinvented itself as a global player. Uh, at the time of the, at the peak of the Cold War, at the peak of the, the decolonization, which happened. So at a time when also global society was rethinking itself and, and, uh, and also international legal order was reinventing and re, uh, rediscussing itself. And um, for those of you who are lawyers and are following this debates in international law, maybe the comparison to the Bandung conference in 1955 uh, is a, a point that should be considered here. And if we think about legal scholarship today, engaging with Bandung as not just a legal event, but also a kind of media event um, is in a sense quite similar to or comparable to what happened at the Second Vatican Council as a political and cu cultural event uh, going beyond the narrow confines of religion itself. So the, the aim of the council was to re-engage with modern society uh, and, uh, and post-enlightenment society in a sense in a global world. But of course, the relation to other non-Christian religions and in particular Judaism was one of the key issues that people needed to, uh, to come to terms with after the events uh, of the Holocaust. And the, the, the declaration Nostra Aetate, um, which uh, Kama mentioned, that deals with the relation between Christians and Jews, uh, was also intended to uh, engage with this uh, topic. And uh, the German uh, theologians and also bishops were some of the main players. Um, Cardinal Augustin Beer, who will be mentioned again as a correspondent of Fritz Bauer in a minute, um, was a German Jesuit who was the kind of coordinator for this document. Um, but given also the geopolitical situation at the time and the conflict in the Middle East, uh, it turned out that there was some, um, some critique internally also to uh, deal with Jewish-Christian relation in a kind of exclusive manner. So in the end, the document also covers other non-Christian uh, religions. It starts with some reflection on Buddhism and, and Hinduism, then it, uh, it's, it has a part on the relation between Christians and Muslims. And then um, we have this fourth part that speaks about relations of Christians and Jews. And the development of this document, which was promulgated in December 1965, um, was also um, a process that uh, involved the Jewish interlocutors, of course, Abraham Heschel, the father of Susanna Heschel, was an important voice in this process, but also um, uh, protagonists of Judaism in Germany. And one important uh, interlocutor was Fritz Bauer, the, uh, the Advocate General of the State of Hessen, who was the main driver of um, not only the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial, in the early 1960s, but also, as we know today from the archives, uh, the main um, actor between, uh, behind the, uh, the seizure of uh, Adolf Eichmann and the person who really facilitated the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in 1961. And uh, Fritz Bauer, um, a German Jewish lawyer from the southwest of Germany who had uh, survived the Holocaust in Denmark and Sweden, and then returned very early on and was one of the few German Jewish lawyers who re-entered uh, judicial service in Germany and then became um, really a, a driving force in uh, dealing with uh, uh, crimes in the Holocaust on a judicial plane. Um, he was very interested in this debate that happened in the Vatican, and he corresponded with Augustin Cardinal Bea, who was the coordinator. Um, and clearly to him, it was very important to get rid of all kinds of, uh, kind of, uh, kinds of very critical references to Judaism in uh, Christian uh, theology, in, in preaching and in teaching, uh, because he 
uh, he saw there also kind of didactical and pedagogical role for uh, the church and the Catholic uh, church to, to get a process underway where um, society as a whole dealt with these uh, issues. And in the context of his engagement with the debate on Nostra Aetate, Fritz Bauer also wrote a piece on the trial of Jesus, um, which is now published in, in his selected uh, works edited by uh, Lena Foglianti and, and others that came out some, some um, time ago. And uh, he, uh, to him, clearly, this was a very meaningful um, process. And I think this illustrates that also for, uh, for um, people in the legal field, uh, this was um, a series of events that was expected to have some wider impact, far beyond the confines of uh, interreligious uh, connections and theological debates, but also really a process triggering and facilitating a profound uh, social and cultural uh, change. And therefore, I think these debates and also the kind of uh, micro story that Karma uh, related in her presentation today uh, touches really upon um, a kind of key issue that was of relevance for legal actors in the mid 20th century. So the, I mentioned already also the political uh, salience of these, uh, these debates. There would be much to say also about the role of actors like, like Abraham, uh, Abraham Heschel. What really facilitated uh, Nostra Aetate itself was this very kind of uh, historical turn of Catholic theology uh, in the mid 20th century that already had started before the Second World War and Kama mentioned uh, um, the, um, the ressourcement, the, uh, the, this kind of uh, French German uh, movement that went back to the historical uh, roots, uh, went uh, for a critical re-engagement with biblical sources, but also with the early Christian theologians from the early centuries, the church fathers. And therefore, and thereby also opened a way for a kind of contextualized engagement with um, uh, with biblical sources, but also with early comments on these uh, sources and the whole Christian tradition, in contrast to a very stable and doctrinal neo-Thomist um, tradition. And uh, it's interesting that Leon Ashkenazi, uh, the protagonist of Karma's presentation today, um, in a sense, uh, was part of this very intellectual scene where also the, uh, the ressourcement and the, the Dominican school of Solchois, uh, where uh, some of these, the protagonists of this movement belong to, um, were located. Uh, so he was very much aware, as also Karma has shown in her presentation, of this kind of, um, of contextual um, approach and historicist approach to, um, uh, to uh, engagement with these uh, sources. And therefore, it's uh, to me a bit of surprising that he um, just uh, goes for a kind of reinterpretation of Jewish-Christian relations um, that in a sense uh, just um, changes the positions and, and doesn't, uh, doesn't break really with this kind of father-son uh, narrative, the Jacob and Esau narrative, where we still have this, this debate uh, now just in, in another uh, vein, who comes first and who has to educate uh, the other. And what is interesting in this context is that Nostra Aetate, in a sense, breaks to a certain extent with this, uh, with this narrative. And I just would like to read you briefly the key uh, part of the of the document, which I think merits also uh, to be read in full. It's not very long, but it's I think it's really a very important kind of intellectual source uh, in 20th century history. And here it says in its in its fourth part, uh, the church keeps ever in mind the words of the apostle, meaning Paul, about his kinsmen, and it quotes Paul from the letter to the Romans: "Theirs is the sonship and the glory and the covenants and the law and the worship and the promises." Theirs are the fathers, and from them is the Christ according to the flesh. 
That's the quote from Paul. And um, the document says, she also, the church, recalls that the apostles, the church's mainstay and pillars, as well as most of the early disciples who pro proclaimed Christ's gospel to the world, sprang from the Jewish people. True, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of the Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against, the, against all Jews, without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jews of today. The Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as this is as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. All should see to it then that in catechetical work or in the preaching of the word of God, they do not teach anything that does not conform to the truth of the gospel and the spirit of Christ. Furthermore, in her rejection of every persecution against any man, the church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews and moved not by political reasons, but by the gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. So end of quote from, from Nostra Etate. So that's a very clear statement against uh, anti-Semitism, which, lie, uh, which uh, was already at the core of the uh, initial debates about this um, declaration, which uh, was in, in the making for several years before then becoming proclaimed. And I think the what is indicated here, this kind of um, more ambivalent, but ambivalent probably not so much in a negative, but also in a positive sense that leaves way for, um, for the very complex uh, interconnections of Jewish-Christian relations, uh, I, I think this interrelation is also voiced in a very interesting way in one of the uh, God Friday petitions, which are part of the, of the Catholic liturgy. And there's one, um, one prayer that has also caused much of debate, which in its traditional version was a prayer for the conversion of the Jews. And there was even talk about the perfidious Jews, mm -hmm. Judea, uh, perfidious Jude. Uh, and this was a, was a formulation which um, was um, taken out of this prayer by, um, by Pope John the uh, 23rd, the initiator of the Second Vatican Council, in 1959, so after he had come to, to power and, uh, and also prohibited for the whole church. And then af after the council in the kind of reformed liturgy, this petition was completely reformulated. And um, I will just give you briefly the, the current version in the reformed um, liturgy. And here it says, let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God, that they may continue to grow in the love of his name and in the faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and his posterity. Listen to, to your church as we pray that the people you first made your own may arrive at the fullness of redemption. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. So, what is uh, what what this prayer um, expresses is a kind of open ended but also immediate relationship of Christians and Jews towards God. There is no express uh, um, uh, statement as to who is closer or who who comes first. There's a kind of historical um, acknowledgement of the Jews as the people who in the biblical tradition have been addressed um, by the God of the Torah first, but there, it's not a statement that somehow expresses some kind of priority um, in, in this sense. And I think that's very much the tradition which was, uh, which was founded and grounded in uh, the thinking and the theological debates of Vatican II. Of course, there has been uh, in recent years some debate about this petition in particular, also with the kind of um, we renewed interest in the Tridentine liturgy, but I won't go uh, into that. Uh, but what I find interesting here, and what I wanted to clarify with these uh, detailed uh, textual uh, elements, is that for me, this it is quite surprising that Ashkenazi, who followed these uh, debates, uh, still takes a turn towards a more, let's say, traditional, controversial and dichotomic um, approach to these uh, to these uh, issues, which is 
interesting and should certainly be be considered also by Christian theologians. Um, but in a sense, to me, uh, seems also not to be a very promising avenue if we think about Christian Jewish relations, but also on in a wider um, in a wider sense about interreligious uh, inter relations more more broadly. But these are just my two cents. I've taken too much time.